All right, so here we're going to talk about our opportunistic fungi. And again, these are going to be fungi that are very common in the environment. They usually are not going to cause any problem for most people who are immune competent, but they are going to have opportunities to infect those who are undergoing surgeries, who are debilitated, who are immune, who are immune suppressive therapies. Um, and so it's very important to understand these fungi. Most of them, or many of them that are going to be common are going to be um, a yeast. Candida, for example, is always a yeast. Others are going to be a mold. Aspergillus is a mold inside our bodies and outside our bodies. And so, um, again, these are going to be considered kind of accidental. Fungi don't need to infect us. Uh, but if there's an opportunity, they will take it because we are a very nutrient-rich environment for them. So some fun facts about these guys. We have Candida albicans, which is the most common yeast that's going to cause opportunistic fungal diseases. Candida is also part of our normal flora, so that makes it very capable of um, being introduced into our bodies accidentally. Aspergillus uh, fumigatus is the most common mold, and so one thing to keep in mind with respect to both of these is Candida is always a yeast. And Aspergillus is always a mold. This is very different from our systemic mycoses that were thermal dimorphism. They were a yeast inside of us and a mold outside of us. These are um, two are always going to be either a yeast or a mold. Um, Cryptococcus neoformans is going to be the most common cause of fungal meningitis. And so this is important because our um, systemic mycoses can also cause meningitis. But to get infected with those, you have to kind of go to a, a certain area of the world. And so with these um, opportunistics, they are going to be worldwide. They're going to be everywhere. Um, Candida is everywhere. Aspergillus is everywhere. Cryptococcus neoformans is everywhere. Pneumonocystis cerevecchi is everywhere. And so that's why they are opportunistic. Um, Pneumonocystis cerevecchi is the most common opportunistic pathogen in AIDS patients. This is very highly associated with AIDS patients and the progression of, of AIDS uh, and can also be part of why people succumb to um, AIDS, HIV. Now, we're going to have um, molds commonly found in the environment that are your people who are immune compromised are going to get exposed to. They can also be introduced if there is some sort of trauma, of course. Um, and there are a few exceptions to this, and the two are the three are listed here. We have Cryptococcus, Candida, and Pneumonocystis cerevecchi. They're all going to be yeast-like. Um, Cryptococcus is a yeast in nature, and you get you inhale yeast cells. Candida is a yeast that colonizes human, and so that's going to be an endogenous infection. Pneumonocystis is yeast-like and is going to mostly cause diseases in immune compromise. So with all of these um, um, opportunistic immune compromise, immune status is what is central for whether or not the person is going to get infected and succumb. So let's just talk about candida for a moment. Um, candida is going to be the most common disease caused because we are colonized with it. Candida albicans, of course, has a lot of virulence factors associated with it. Our normal healthy immune response can overcome those virulence factors, but someone who's immune compromised cannot. An individual who has thrush, oral thrush, that's an indication of somebody who has immune compromised, so that would be a mucosal infection with C. albicans. Albicans can also cause a vaginitis. It can cause nail infections, cardiovascular, fungemia, endocarditis. Um, you also have um, drug abuse, sepsis, and so that is intravenous introduction of candida into the uh, blood of an individual. There are other versions of candida. Um, there's a glabrata, which is going to be associated with urinary tract infections. Um, you have tropicalis, which is going to be in hematologic malignancies. Cruzi is going to cause general fungemia, which is dissemination. 
Um, and parasolysis is going to be catheter-related fundamia. So all of them, of course, these are opportunistic, and so they are going to be able to cause disease because the individual is compromised. So for candida, this is um, just a image of the different three different varieties and the age groups that they are going to infect. And you can see C. albicans is basically in every age group. The others change. So um, glabrata, which is going to be associated with urinary tract infection, really comes up later in life, right? So you see it rise later in life. Um, and then the parasolosis is going to be associated with catheters. And so you can imagine that um, you have premature infants that can potentially get exposed. And then you have a very low level of this as you go on through life. So what the take home is, is that even though there are other varieties of candida, albicans is the majority of the infections for humans. Now in the healthy individuals, so if you have someone who is healthy, usually candida is a nail infection um, or cutaneous infection or a vaginitis. But then it's going to get uh, cleared. In immune compromised, A candida infection is life-threatening. Okay, the yeast is going to be able to grow very rapidly in culture, so it's very easy to diagnose. However, low levels of the yeast circulate in blood, so often you'll take a blood sample and you'll be able to culture the yeast. We also have some antibiotic resistance in um, Candida cruzi and glabrata. I can mention that up here. So there's some um, antifungal resistance. So both of these have some fungal resistance to drugs. Candida albicans usually does not. So candida albicans, just like all of what we're talking about here, are going to be opportunistic. Um, candida albicans is going to be part of our normal flora, so it's able to get in very um, easily. Risk factors for um, severe disease, so we have some risk factors. And these are going to be um, an, a malignancy, hematologic malignancy. A neural, a neural surgery. Um, of course, in trauma, introduction directly into a wound, blood. Now, diagnosis, um, candida can be diagnosed in the lab. You can observe the yeast in the microscope, and the yeast grows very fast. They do have antigen tests, nucleic acid tests, because it's so common. Um, Candida's normal flora, so again, it can be a contaminant, not necessarily a cause. You must take multiple um, samples and confirm every single time you have candida. You can use chrome auger to differentiate the different candida species. Um, Albicans is typically going to be a green color. Tropicalis will be pink cruzi. Sorry, Tropicalis is blue, cruzi will be pink. So these are going to be detecting different enzymes in the, um, the yeast. And these enzymes are going to trigger a different color change um, because of, that's the way the auger was generated. 
Um, treatment is going to be with itraconazole, uh, these azoles mostly, and we'll talk about the azoles and how they work. Um, amphotericin B is going to be another, especially if it's immune compromised, to get systemic. Again, glabrata and cruzi are going to be more resistant to azoles, um, so you're going to have to use other fungal antifungal agents for if there's an infection with glabrata or cruzi. And you can use those chrome augers to determine which one it is. Um, you can also do, it's important to note, antifungal prophylactic therapy. So this is giving therapy to people who, don't, who are immune compromised, who do not have a fungal infection, to help prevent a fungal infection. And there is very little um, resistance. They, they're not like bacteria. They don't transfer resistant genes to each other. Antifungal agents are pretty old, and they haven't changed very much over decades. And so, um, and, and again, most of them work very well. Now, moving on to Cryptococcus neoformans. Cryptococcus is shown here, and you can see there's no mold form. So Cryptococcus are spherical yeast. And they have a true polysaccharide capsule. I'm going to put true. So you can see that you have the yeast inside. Let me see if I can do this. You have the yeast inside, and then you have the capsule surrounding it on the outside. So this is going to be found worldwide. So again, all these opportunistics are worldwide. And this is particularly high in soil with pigeon droppings. And so anyone who lives in a city knows there's always pigeons around. Um, it is the most common fungal pathogen to cause meningitis. And it's because it's so widespread, people who are immune compromised get exposed to it all the time. And it's going to disseminate and be able to cause meningitis. It's an important cause of infection with people with T-cell deficiencies, including HIV, as well as our organ transplant patients. Okay, so again, you're going to inhale the spores, or inhale the yeast, sorry. These aren't spores, so you inhale yeast. Um, and then your um, yeast are going to uh, divide inside of you and form these little capsules. Now, for Cryptococcus neoformans, what's interesting about this one in, with respect to the clinical disease um, is that you're usually going to have meningitis as the presenting disease. And this is because immune competent people will clear this, so you're never going to see a lung disease. And in an immune compromised individual, it's going to spread so quickly that the presentation is going to be a meningitis, even though it started out as a lung disease. Now, diagnosis is going to be looking for um, your buddy yeast, and you're looking also for your capsule. So you're looking for a uh, yeast inside of oops, inside of a capsule, um, and you want to take your your sample from your blood, sputum, or cerebral spinal fluid, um, which is going to be a very reliable source because again we're going to present mostly with meningitis with this guy. And then you look for the yeast. There are also antigen tests for the capsule. Um, the treatment for cryptococcus, again, meningitis will be fatal if it's not treated. 
So if an individual is not able to control the infection before it got to the central nervous system, they're not going to be able to control the infection when it gets to the nervous system. So you want to use amphotericin B and fluconazole and azole for treatment. And then you also are going to have to put a person on maintenance treatment just to make sure that you get everything. You can also, again, use prophylactic use of antifungals uh, for high-risk patients. You also have to make sure, because it's deadly to these patients who are presenting with the disease, that you have to monitor to make sure that the therapy actually worked, or else you have to keep them on the therapy for longer periods of time. Malassezia furfur is another opportunistic. This is going to be a yeast-like fungus. This is going to be related to catheters. Um, what Malassezia furfur needs is it requires special lipids for growth. And so people who are receiving lipid infusions, for whatever reason, um, can get infected with malice fervor too. Uh, you treat this by removing catheters and discontinuing lipid fusions. So it's not a very robust um, fungus. So as long as you remove what the cause is, then um, typically people can recover from this. Aspergillus. Aspergillus, of course, is everywhere. It's a very common mold in the environment. Um, fumigatus is the most common and you're going to inhale spores in order to get infected with aspergillus and aspergillus is a check that color, of mold in, in, in the environment and it is a mold in ourselves. So all that hyphae, all that mycelium we talked about, that's all going to be part, it's going to be in your body if you have an aspergillus infection. Um, treatment for pulmonary aspergillus is going to be um, our azole therapy. Um, again, for invasive dissemination, amphotericin B is a go-to. Prophylaxis in high-risk patients is going to be important. Itraconazole, another is azole, can be used for that. Um, low toxicity associated with itraconazole. Um, and again, the mold is everywhere in the environment. So people who are at risk, people who are immune compromised, should avoid areas where you can get the uh, aerosolization of your spores and that will cause inhalation. Such things as remodeling, construction, and then finally, just a list of some other opportunistic molds. Um, so we have a rhizopus species, mucoralis. These are going to be non-pigmented molds. And again, these are going to cause disease in immune-compromised patients. And this is going to target diabetic patients, typically with metabolic acidosis. Uh, fusarium are going to be septate non-pigmented molds. These are going to... Uh, be again immune compromise. Of note, you can isolate these guys from the blood. So if you do see a mold inside the blood, fusarium or of the like would be a possible consideration. Bipolaris, alternaria are going to be septate pigmented molds. These are going to follow trauma. They can also disseminate in immune compromised patients. So again, even though we have our more common, our cryptococcus, our um, candida, our aspergillus, there are other molds in the environment that can cause infection in a person who is immune compromised.